Good morning. We're live. Let's get everybody just a few moments to catch up and, and get on with us this morning. We're going to go someplace very special this morning. So we'll just uh, hang out here for a minute and uh, let everybody have a chance to jump on board. Welcome. We're giving everyone just a couple of moments to, to join us this morning. So no one misses out on what we're talking about this morning. It's always great to be with you on a Monday morning. It's, it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. We had a full moon here last night. I got up in the middle of the night and looked through the window in the bathroom, and there it was just shining through. Beautiful. Um, what a great moment in time. So we're getting ready for holiday seasons, the next set of holiday seasons. Hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We had a few family members here trying to keep the, the crowds down a little bit, but yet having a little bit of time. We're so excited because all the construction was done and the dust was cleaned up and we're able to, to do a, a first test run to see what actually needs to be put away in closets with little kids running around and what they could use. And we had a great time. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family and friends. Well, this morning, we're going to go someplace that can be a little challenging, but it, it could open up a door for you in really difficult moments to push through to do what's required to create success. When Paul and I are teaching these principles, Paul Blanchard, my son, incredible human being, um, handpicked by Jack Welsh to be the director of admissions for the Jack Welsh Management Institute uh, Executive MBA program in Herndon, Virginia. And I brought him back here six years ago to be the president of Habit Finder, which is part of our Og Mandino family. Uh, it's actually the way in which we measure the habits of thinking Og talks about in the 10 scrolls. So if you're studying the 10 scrolls, found in the greatest salesman in the world and in the greatest secret, then let's measure those habits and see where you are. That's habit finder and then provide you with principles and practices to actually make the shifts. And that's the name of that program is shift. Uh, something you'll want to consider. So take that assessment if you haven't. But you'll notice that we don't water anything down. The secret <laughs> To success is not like some secret formula. You know, if you could take this pill or that pill or read this book or that book, all your problems are solved. Because at the basis of all of that is a word I've never used before in Augment, but I'm going to use it this morning. I was introduced to it by uh, Barry Michaels and, and Phil Stutz, two really wonderful psychoanalysts. And the word is exoneration. Wow, that word, the more I, when I verbalize the word exoneration, it's when we're here in life <laughs> and we're facing the challenges, the daily challenges. And it's like, we wanna be exonerated. We wanna be excused. We wanna be pardoned, if you will, from having to participate in those painful pieces. We want to be exonerated. And I, I have to, with all empathy, share with you that a deep appreciation for anybody's desire to be exonerated. It's understandable that there are times when life is just like, ah. And we would like it to just be easier for a period of time. But that's just not this planet. As frustrating as that can be, it's just not this planet. So when we're seeking for that ease and less stress, we have a tendency to buy into anything that sounds like an easy road. It's the, it's the interviews after the session on magically manifesting something through vivid visualization. Oh, I just knew there was a way to just think, make my dream board and just visualize it and visualize it. We've talked a lot about this and I'm not going to spend my time diving too deeply into this. I just love the word exonerated. 
Ah, can you feel it? Wouldn't that be interesting? However, if it were possible, we would stop doing the very things that help us grow and magnify our very purpose for being on this planet. And I emphasize that because in that discussion, we find a great secret. So if we have been in this space and we're getting ready for these holidays and a new year, 2021, oh my goodness, we'll be grateful to have it here. And hopefully we can get vaccines in place and get the pandemic under control and get finances stabilized in people's lives and back to some sense of normal. Wouldn't that be wonderful, 2021? 10 years from now, we'll, we'll look back and we'll be amazed how we survive something this traumatic. You're doing well. So just be okay with that. You're doing pretty well. Considering everything that's going on, you're doing really well. So just pause for a moment. Just be with that. I'm, I'm doing okay. Now I'm going to pull myself together and propel myself into forward motion. I don't want to be exonerated. I don't want to be excused from the trials of life. You know, maybe I want to, <laughs> but since it's not possible, I'm going to take a different look at life and I'm going to choose and the words we want to play with here. And the words are so important. I want to stop being a consumer where I'm just trying to find things that will bring me peace and often buying things. And if anybody's been there, we had Black Friday last Friday. We buy all these things. They start showing up and and then the credit card bill shows up and we're not as excited about some of those things anymore. It was temporary. When we're a consumer, we're temporarily trying to fill some void in our soul by buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying, and buying hoping somehow one of those things will somehow make the difference. It never does. It never does. No matter how big it is, no matter how many zeros there are in the price tag, it does not do it other than for a short period of time. So being a consumer is not going to be an answer. Being a creator is. When we're a creator, we get to play with higher forces and principles that, that order the planets. We get to participate. We get to create something of value so that when we leave this planet, the second time I've mentioned this, when we leave this planet, we will have left a footprint. It will have mattered that we were here. We left more than we took. We weren't here just to take and take and take and take and then die. We were here to give and serve and lift and build and create. So wanting to become a creator. Well, there are times, and that's what this morning is about. There are times when the very best intentions just aren't enough. It's what separates those who can push through in that last moment and those who just quit. What is it? The words are will power. We will our own power. We reach deep inside our own soul and we make a decision to push. Now, if you study the universe, one of the most amazing pieces is that we are totally free. We have free agency, free will. There is nothing in the universe compelling us to move forward, to put ourselves in forward motion, to be a creator. Nothing compels us. We can choose not to. Whatever force you want to call that, a higher force, greater force, whatever you want to call it, loves us enough to let us make that final decision. That's up to us. Everything can be put in the place. The plate can be laid out with a beautiful banquet of, of, of cool, cool things. But the choice is ours. The final choice is ours. And 
Barry Michaels and, and, and Phil Stutz have studied this for years and years and years. And they, they came up with something very similar to something we've been teaching for years. We teach it in planning and goal setting. In the planning and goal setting, we say, let's go to age 85. The reason why age 85, because that's, that's pretty close to leaving the planet, right? So if you actually were there and you're looking back at your life and Ramona and I will be in our favorite place, we'll be sitting on the back deck overlooking a lake, I'm sure, because we just love lakes, holding our cup of hot chocolate, and just being with one another. And I've said before, she's had a lot of wrinkles at that age, and I created most of them. And we're examining our life. We're examining our life. Phil and, and Barry said that it's critical that we go to our deathbed to find the willpower. They call it jeopardy. Because if you're on your deathbed, and you know this is your last day, there is a tremendous sense of urgency. <laughs> tremendous sense of urgency that it be spent well. I'm going to invite all of us for just a moment to go to that moment. I'm 67, so I want to go to 95 or 100. But let's go like to 85. My father passed away at 83, my mother at 84. So if we just look at those moments and go, okay, I'm there. Would you just go there with me? And we've said... Our grandkids are coming to see us. Our great-grandkids are coming to see us. Why do they want to come other than the reading of the will, right? Why do they love us? And what did we create from today? Today being the 30th of November. Tomorrow is December. Wow. The 30th of November until age 85. What did we create? What actions did we take? We use it as a planning mechanism. Phil and Barry said we use it as a jeopardy moment. They've taken it to a whole new level. We're not just using it to decide the kind of things we'd want to plan. We're using it to create jeopardy. It's like, well, are we not creating something that forces us? No, what we're doing is going to a time when our awareness is so heightened and our presence in the moment so acute that we can really see the value of every moment in our life. That creates jeopardy. If you can actually go there and feel that awareness of the critical nature of every moment, the urgency, then bring that back to the activity of the day. If you're working on physical health, that would be exercise. Okay, then I go do my exercise because I can feel the urgency of taking care of me. I'm finally grounded, present in the moment, ready to take the actions necessary, and I take them. I feel a sense of jeopardy. Well, but nobody's forcing us. That's the point. We're just using the awareness then to bring that level of awareness into our present moment. Our present moment. So if we can fully grasp our deathbed, that's what they're saying. Deathbed, not I'm planning my life. That's a great idea for planning. But in terms of free will, in terms of will power, something that will drive us is creating jeopardy and creating in that moment and really feeling what that would be like with that level of acute awareness being that present in the moment and bringing that presence to this moment going 
what decision will I make in my life right now in terms of my diet, in terms of my exercise, in terms of my reading and studying and growing, in terms of taking on my fear. We talked about the last two augments. We're going to reverse that desire to avoid pain because it just grows when we avoid it. It chases us when we try to run away from it. We're going to actually embrace it, bring it on. I love pain. Pain sets me free, put us into forward motion, unlock providence, and see miracles occur in our life when we've chosen to be that creator. The thing that can make this happen when we don't feel like it because there will be times, at least for me, that I don't feel like it. Then go practice Jeopardy in that moment. Put yourself on your deathbed. Within a few hours, you won't be on this planet. Feel that urgency, that awareness, that hesitation, that regret for the things that weren't done. And bring that to now and help that drive you into bring it on. I love pain, not masochistic pain. We talked about that the last two weeks because masochists create pain to justify staying in their comfort zone. That's why the pain's been manufactured. So they can justify staying there. That's not what we're doing. We're converting this pain. We're feeling it. We're we're taking the stories out of it and just feeling the pain of it, breaking through it and letting it set us free by putting us into forward motion. It's a great concept. But what happens when we just don't feel like it? We need willpower. The one thing that separates those who do it anyway and those who allow their mind to control their body. Ogmandino talks about this in scroll number six. Weak is he who allows his thoughts to control his actions. Strong is he who forces his actions to control his thoughts. How do we do that? Well, Barry and Phil gave us a tool. It's called Jeopardy. <laughs> I'm going to encourage you all to practice this several times. You might have to do it several times a day. Just really put yourself on your deathbed. Feel the urgency. Feel that sense of every single second matters. You can't buy another hour. Og talks about this in school five. Let me read this to you because it's, it's an incredible statement. And so true. What dying man can purchase another breath, though he willingly give all his gold? What price dare I place on the hours ahead? Oh, I've been teaching this to us for years, just not in the form of jeopardy. I will make them priceless. How do we make them priceless? If we don't feel like it, then go to your deathbed, create that urgency, bring that back and have it push you through and move into forward motion and make this day count. I wrote this at the very beginning of the scroll. Oh, I just love this. When he says, can the sand flow upward in the hourglass? Will the sun rise before it sets and set where it rises? Can I relive the errors of yesterday and write them? No. Before that, one of my favorite statements. I will let not one drop spill upon the sand. I will not spend one moment mourning yesterday's defeats, yesterday's aches for the heart. For why should I throw good, that's today, after bad? And then later he says, nor will I torment myself over things that may never come to pass. We're going to live this day as if it is our last. And if we don't feel like reversing our desire and embracing the pain and breaking through that barrier, then we're going to go into the future 
and practice Jeopardy. And get a real touch because we're all going to die. And the older you get, the more profound that becomes. I remember a moment in July. I had been having palpations and some other challenges with my heart for several days. Tachycardia, they call it. It was unnerving. And then my left calf started to hurt like a knife was being stuck in it. It wouldn't stop. It was constant. And Wednesday, I finally decided to go to the outpatient care and check it out. I was just concerned. I, mean, I was a linebacker in college. I mean, you play her, right? I didn't want him to think I was a wimp. I was going to go there and it was going to stop hurting. Isn't that how many times have you been in pain? You've gone to like to emergency room and then feel okay. Well, I went there and I didn't feel okay. And they, they took a look and said, you, you need to be in the emergency room like now. And I said, well, I drove here. You can't drive. I got to drive home. They said, okay, we got to do an EKG to make sure you're not having a heart attack. I wasn't in the moment. So they let me drive home. Ramona drove me to the hospital. It's COVID, so there's all kinds of you know, protections, except for wearing masks for sitting in the room. And they call me up. They check me in. And they take me into the room. I... I didn't even get to say goodbye. And because I hadn't been tested for COVID, I was immediately tested for it and put into quarantine for 24 hours till they got the test results. She couldn't see me. And I'm lying there in the emergency room for several hours while they're doing tests and they do a blood test. Oh my goodness, it looks like you might have a blood clot. They took me up and do a CT scan. I've got bilateral pulmonary embolus, blood clots in both my lungs, so that blood clot in my leg was setting little blood clots up and going through my heart. That's what was causing the tachycardia. And then they were lodging. They go down in, into your, in your lungs, and they were lodging in the smallest vessels and starting to fill up. And they admitted me. And it was early the next morning, about 3 o'clock, and the nurse came in and said, we got to put you on oxygen. And they put me on oxygen. I thought, well, that's okay. And they came in like 30 minutes later and said, we need to increase your oxygen. And 30 minutes later, we need to increase. They couldn't keep my oxygen levels up. And I had my moment. I asked the question, am I going to die here? Is my lung capacity going to keep going down? I know I've got bilateral pulmonary embolus. I've got two dear friends who died from that in their sleep. The doctor didn't say that to me for two weeks. He said two weeks later, you know, people die from this. I knew that. <laughs> and I had this moment of reflecting on Ramona, our family and life and what was really important. It was a life changing moment. It was the first time in my life where I really very literally practice jeopardy because I thought I could be. It's possible. I may be on my deathbed and I may die without him being able to say goodbye. And so many in this COVID process have died without being able to say goodbye. Either their loved ones saying goodbye or them being able to say goodbye. What a, what a sad end. But what an interesting moment. I got to feel jeopardy. So when I was studying Barry and Phil's work, this just spoke to my soul because I had felt that moment. I want to encourage us all to feel it this morning. Really feel that Jeopardy moment and see if that Jeopardy can drive us. A little willpower to push through those moments when we don't feel like it so that we can get on the other side of that obstacle and grow Get prepared for the next one. Get through that one. Grow. Get through the next one and grow. Because we don't want to be consumers. We don't want to ask to be exonerated from pain. We want to be creators. Creators. 
Thanks everybody for being with us this morning. May this serve each one of you. Practice this as often as you need to this week and see if it can't create some real power to drive those dark moments. Thanks everyone. Much love.